So we've launched this critical conversation series thanks to the generous support of anonymous donors and their commitment to making the higher education experience and the campus experience in particular, rich and diverse points of view and a place where people have hard conversations informed by facts in a civil manner. At Perry World House, we see this as a remarkable opportunity to encourage fair, fact-based discussions about the vital public issues that require public policy responses. This is one of the many reasons our World Forum, this glorious light-filled room, those of you who are here in person are sitting in was created to facilitate and foster dialogue, knowledge, exchange of ideas and learning. We hope that this experience and others like it are an opportunity to hear facts and reasoned discourse to weigh arguments, to consider other points of view, to perhaps change one's mind, and if not, to at least be aware of another side. So bear with us as we experiment a little with this format and as we launch into this new area of really difficult conversations about which people have and tend to have very strong feelings. Today's program will consider the question, can reparations redress the harms of colonization and slavery? You can find larger, or pardon me, longer bios online, but at this time I'd like to introduce and welcome to the stage our two discussants and moderator. Jeremy Black is Emeritus Professor of History at the University of Exeter. He did postgraduate work at the University of Oxford and taught at Durham University before moving to Exeter in 1996. He has lectured extensively in Europe, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the United States, where he has held visiting chairs at West Point, Texas Christian University, and Stillman College. He was named member of the most excellent order of the British Empire for services to staff design. He has written over 100 books, many of which examine aspects of 18th century British, European, and American political, diplomatic, and military history. On the other side, Jeremy Sarkin is a distinguished research professor of law at Nova University in Lisbon. He has worked in the field of transnational, pardon me, of transitional justice for decades after being involved in the Truth and Reconciliation Committee Commission process in South Africa. He has worked on such processes in countries including Uganda, Zambia, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Tunisia, Bangladesh, and Syria. He served as an acting judge in the High Court in South Africa and as chairperson rapporteur of the United Nations Working Group on Enforced or Involuntary Disappearances. Throughout his career, Sarkin has published 19 books, including the books Reparations for Colonial Genocide and Germany's Genocide of the Herero. Our esteemed moderator is Deneen Brown, an award-winning writer for the Washington Post, where she has been for more than three decades. And when I read that, I asked her earlier, Jim, like that must be a typo, but indeed she has been with the Washington Post for over three decades. She is an associate professor at the Philip Merrill College of Journalism at the University of Maryland. She has written extensively about the United States history of racial terror lynchings and massacres. She has written extensively on the US 1921 Tulsa race massacre. And that work is featured in two documentaries, Rise Again, Tulsa in the Red Summer and Tulsa, the Fire and the Forgotten. From 2000 to 2004, she was a foreign correspondent for the Washington Post, becoming the first black woman to cover Canada for the paper. And before I welcome our guests to the stage, I wanna make sure that those of you who are in person have used what was a QR code to vote. And that those of you who are online have used um, the online link to vote. And with that, thank you for joining us and I welcome our guests to the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Deneen Brown. I'm happy to be here to moderate this critical conversation, which will explore the burning question of whether reparations can redress past harms caused by colonization and enslavement. Um, 
before we open the discussion, I just wanted to frame the issue a bit. Oops. Last year, Ghana led a league of countries who were demanding reparations for past harms caused by colonizers. Those countries included Tanzania, Burundi, Cameroon, Congo, and Namibia. Namibia is seeking reparations for genocide, uh, genocide that occurred there that left more than 80,000 people dead. Tanzania has requested reparations for atrocities committed during the Maji Maji War, uh, and, and it's called for apologies from Brit, uh, Britain and from Germany. Burundi and Cameroon are demanding that Germany and Belgium pay at least $43 billion in reparations for historic crimes. They're also demanding that these countries return artifacts. Countries in the Caribbean have called on Europe to pay at least $50 billion for 200 years of enslavement. So some justice act activists have said they want more than apologies, they want reparations. They want repayment for stolen resources and human labor that contributed to Europe's rise of power built on the backs of their, their countries. On the other side, former colonizers have apologized for the crimes during the colonial period, but stopped, many have stopped short of paying reparations. For example, in 2021, Belgium's King Philippe expressed deepest regrets for atrocities in the De Democratic Republic of Congo, but the King did not address the question of reparations. So this brings us to the first set of questions for our esteemed guests. Here's, um, we want them to ask, answer the question, are reparations a fair and just, just method for repairing historical injustices and crimes against humanities committed by former colonial powers? As part of your response, please explain how you define reparations and what does it mean to repair past harms committed by colonizers? You'll have five minutes to respond, and we'll start with the first speaker, Professor Jeremy Sarkin. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for coming. I think this is an important debate because it's really important to remember that over the last few days, the United Nations commemorated the International Day for the Remembrance of the Victims of the Slave Trade. So it's on the agenda for the UN. It's been a resolution on the floor before the General Assembly. Uh, in 2021, the Human Rights Council issued a statement and issued a resolution supported by many countries saying that reparations was due and the legacy of the slave trade and colonialism was having deep effects around the world. The Secretary General has made those same comments and he made those comments on International Remembrance Day a few days ago. We have to understand what are we talking about with reparations because most people who are against the idea of reparations think it's only about money, but there are various aspects of reparations and it can be about money, but it can be a range of other things. So certainly it can be about apologies, it can be about educational grants, it can be about symbolism. But at the time we have to reckon with how much devastation colonialism and the issues of the slave trade caused. Just a few details. If we think, for example, about the decimation of populations in Africa, in Asia, and elsewhere. Just one example, the Hawaiian people fell in population numbers from 800,000 in about 1700 to about 50,000 in 1900. The indigenous population of Australia fell from 300,000 in the 1800s to 50,000 people. We're not even mentioning the 18 million uh, people who were translocated as slaves. The devastation in terms of people's wealth, in terms of income patterns, in terms of health situations, in terms of access to livelihoods, in terms of resources. I was talking before um, this particular panel about how we can take specific examples and see that as being the generality. 
So we need to think about what can be done to repair some of those harms. And the context is, which we should see it in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals, where there are 17 goals, and some of them are about equality. It's about sustainability. It's about reducing poverty. It's a whole range of issues. But fundamentally, we need to find ways of addressing the massive gulps that exist between the global north and the global south. Already, we've seen that the agenda for the SDGs is a long way off achieving its particular goals. And that's because we're not including issues such as dealing with colonialism and dealing with the slave trade. It's about ensuring the dignity of the people who were deeply affected. It's about ensuring, for example, a group that I represent and have represented the Herrera from Namibia, that they've been completely marginalized and completely excluded. Where 120 years ago, they were the dominant group of people because of the access to arable land, they had livestock, that's been completely removed from them. Namibia is deeply affected because the majority of arable land is controlled and owned by 70% of uh, European farmers who don't even live in the country. So there are many issues that need to be dealt with. Colonialism has caused structural racism. It's caused structural discrimination. We need to find ways of addressing those particular issues. The brutality that we see everywhere around the world, the human rights violations that are committed, a lot of it is colonially connected. We also need to see, for example, issues of violence and conflict in many parts of the world, including Africa, can be directly related to colonialism and the slave trade. Just one example, if we look at the Great Lakes today, Rwanda, uh, Burundi, uh, Sudan, those particular conflicts that happen in those regions are di directly related to colonialism. If we think, for example, of the Rwandan genocide, the Rwandan genocide came to pass because of the division into communities of um, Hutu and Tutsi by the colonialists. It wasn't a division that was really seen to be important today. The arbitrary borders that were created across Africa still creates the legacy of tremendous conflict because the borders do not take into account living patterns where people live. So there's a deep reason to undo some of those harms, to find ways to provide reparations. But as I said, reparations is not about money only. There's a need to see reparations in a much wider sense to be able to undo some of those legacies and deal with a whole range of issues. I think my five minutes is up, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, I agree entirely with my colleague that reparations isn't simply about money. I also agree with him that thinking about the relationship between the present and the past is a complex matter. Um, I'm afraid I don't quite agree with him on some of the other points. Um, firstly, I'm not sure that I think that um, colonialization and slavery are uniquely matters of the European experience in terms of imposing things on the rest of the world. Secondly, I don't, I'm uneasy about focusing on the past when we can see both slavery and colonialization in the present. And it always seems to me that the difficult task is really addressing the present. Things like, if you wish to consider it in this light, Chinese colonialism in, say, Tibet or Sinkien, or Russian in Ukraine, or Indonesian in Papua New Guinea. I would say those are colonialism, and that talking about something that happened 300 years ago may or may not be germane. You can decide, you can vote, but it doesn't actually, it's not going to make any difference to the governments in Beijing or Moscow or Jakarta. And as far as slavery is concerned, um, as the United Nations itself has pointed out, we have millions of slaves in the modern world. And again, I'm not convinced that talking about the Atlantic slave trade of the 17th or 18th century helps us with discussing slavery in the present world. 
So I would argue that one's got a more complex situation, that it doesn't hurt if you wish to have people apologize for things that they've done uh, themselves. I think that's a perfectly reasonable thing. I'm not sure I believe contrition is hereditary. I think that that's a rather suspect thing. The notion of what is blood guilt or national guilt is one that has been visited on many communities in the past, and I don't think it's a very attractive one. So my own view is that you should feel contrition for something you've done yourself. Um, I don't even know who my great grandfather was, so I have no idea whether I should feel contrition for him. And I find this idea of hereditary contrition a rather suspect one. But I'm also not sure whether in engaging the prospect and the issues of the present day, I'm not as convinced. I mean, my colleague has a point of view and he's expressed his point of view about the global south and the global north and these sort of issues. I'm not myself as convinced that addressing issues in the past deals with questions about the present. But that's a matter of opinion, but my opinion is a different one. Thank you. Would you like to respond? Well, I believe that the past and the present, and in fact, the future are deeply connected, that we cannot really separate these particular issues out. If we don't know our past, we don't know where we're coming from, and we don't know what affects our present and what affects our future. I'm not talking about individual contrition, I'm talking about societal contrition. And I'm talking about what is the responsibility of colonial states to those they colonized. Broadly speaking, we can see that the movement has changed dramatically over the last 20 years. When I started working for the Herrera community in Namibia in 2001, there was no idea about reparations. There was no even knowledge in Germany that these issues had occurred. So this is a development um, escalating towards acceptance. Um, as I said, these are often debated on, well, this is cash. Somebody wrote a book uh, some years ago who said, well, to do reparations would cost $777 trillion. And that's one way to negate the argument. Critically, it's about finding ways of repairing damage, of undoing the legacy, finding ways of meeting the challenges from the past. I agree with my colleague that the present day sees tremendous challenges, but we need to understand that many of the challenges that exist in places around the world have been deeply affected by colonization and the slave trade. If we look at this country, the legacy of the slave trade has caused certain people to live in um, really disrepair uh, in certain places. And it's a question of trying to redress that. I'm working on issues relating to environmental justice. Uh, African-American people often live in places where there's greater air pollution, greater uh, degradation of water, greater hazardous wastes, greater nuclear facilities. And why do they live there? Because they've inherited very little from their forefathers because of what colonialism did and what the transatlantic slave trade did. So they caught up in those particular situations. And we could say the same is true in many other countries around the world. So we have to find ways of breaking those. The sustainable development goals are clearly about trying to change patterns around inequality, dealing with poverty, uh, allowing people to develop themselves for the sustainability of the planet. So we need to look at it in a much wider sense to try and find ways of dealing with those issues. Thank you very much. Let's move to the second set of questions. I think this will be directed at you, Professor Black. Throughout history, there have been many examples of reparations that, that have been paid to former, former enslavers and colonizers. For example, in 1825, France demanded Haiti pay re of uh, reparations of 115 million francs in exchange for um, Haiti's sovereignty. Uh, another example in 1833 in Britain, when it, Britain ended the slave trade, um, it wasn't the enslaved people who received compensation. It was the enslavers. The British Parliament approved a payment of 15 million pounds and later added 5 million pound, pounds um, and a loan that was just recently paid back. So the question is, this um, 
I, I will also want to say several heads of state and Europe have gone on um, out of their way and to avoid discuss, discussing reparations. Some are, have argued that no one living today is responsible but, uh, for addressing wrongs of the past, which is what you just said. So the question is, what do former colonizers owe the descendants of those colonized? What role does race play in the decisions of whether or not a government pays reparations for past harms? Is it enough to apologize and return cultural objects? That'll be a question for you, but can you answer that question? Uh, yes, most reparations, as I understand it, uh, that have been paid have usually been uh, ones immediately after peace treaties and not in the context we're talking about. So, for example, France had to pay reparations in 1815 to the powers that defeated it in the Napoleonic Wars. In turn, the Germans demanded reparations in 1871. In turn, the French demanded reparations in 1919, each of which were paid. Um, reparations for historic wrongs, however defined, and obviously we can look at these in very different ways, are a much more recent issue. And as my colleague says, they've become one that's been very much advanced in debate, as we're seeing now. Um, there will be a difference of opinion. To my mind, this is much more complicated than is possibly suggested. So if you take slavery, on which I have written several histories, Slavery, of course, was not simply a matter of um, European powers enslaving Africans. That's ridiculous. I mean, obviously, there has been slavery in world history, alas, a very unattractive feature of it, by certainly by our standards, and certainly in my view, there has been slavery in world history, as far as we can see, all the way around. Uh, as far as we can see, it's been practiced on all continents, apart from the only continent without human population, Dan Antarctica. And there are all sorts of, therefore, questions as to how we define those aspects of slavery that people think ought to be compensated. And, you know, I'm not being facetious here by pointing out that obviously Europeans but eventually, the, by the late 18th century, the British played a principal role in the Atlantic slave trade. But of course, they did not enslave the original slaves. They were enslaved in Africa by Africans. And I don't notice much discussion in compensation or reparations by people, shall we say, in America here, seeking compensation from the descendants of those who enslaved them in Africa. And I do think that there is a lot of sort of a failure to think through some of the implications of tracing difficulties. Again, colonialization. The most successful colonial power of the 18th century was China. That's the period in which conquered Tibet, conquered Sinkien, conquered Kashgar, um, kicked the Russians out of the Amur Valley. They went back in the 1850s. I'm not sure that we need to be thinking of colonialization as some pathology of Europe. But if you want to think in sociological terms or societal terms, we are in the United States. I would assume, maybe wrongly, that the majority of the in people in this room are Americans. And, you know, I don't know. Are you responsible for paying reparations to the Philippines, to the people in Puerto Rico, to Native Americans, to the Alaskans who were sold without their consent, um, to the Hawaiians? I don't know. I mean, but I do think that discussing this simply in terms of, not that I'm implying that anybody is doing that, but there's the danger it gets pushed in that direction, discussing it simplistically in terms of a kind of the only groups that have been harmed are X and the only groups doing the harming are Y and you can fill in the X and the Y as you please. I don't think that's very helpful. It's not accurate historically. It may be helpful in terms of present day rhetoric, but that's not my concern. I'm not a politician. Okay, great. Uh, Professor Sarkin could so, respond. 
first of all, let me give you many examples where reparations have been played, including in the US. So for example, after World War II, people who were interned in concentration camps had to wait 40, 50 years for reparations. So Japanese Americans who were interned, native Alaskans who were interned, all received, I think, about $20,000. Um, Jewish people after World War II received today collectively about $100 billion um, and still today are receiving reparations. We can talk about cases such as Tulsa, Oklahoma. We can talk about a range of places where reparations have been paid. We can talk recently about what Canada has done for their indigenous communities. They've agreed, I think the amount is three or five billion dollars to be paid out because of the recent truth commission they had there where the uh, residential schools were so atrocious and how many people, children in those places were killed. Ireland is looking at similar compensation for what happened in Catholic homes where unwed mothers were taken and their children were removed from them. We can talk about an example 15 years ago where Italy paid Libya $10 billion for colonialism and what they caused. My point is there are many examples. Courts in a range of countries, including Argentina 2021, gave millions of dollars in reparations to indigenous people for what they particularly caused. The issue is that generally speaking, the divide has been what can be done inside a country versus what can be done between countries. The major gap is largely that the, the issue concerns the Pandora's box. Not one colonial power is willing to provide reparations because that is the breaking of the dam. The dam remains solid today that the colonial masters refuse to provide reparations because the moment they do, everybody will clamor. It doesn't mean it hasn't happened. So the UK some years ago provided reparations to I think more than a thousand uh, Kenyan women who were raped by British soldiers. They provided reparations for people who were abused during the Mau Mau rebellion. So there are many examples, but as I say, the generality hasn't been achieved, but certainly it's a finding way of dealing with those issues. It's certainly about finding issues to deal with the criminality that happened because many of the cases that occurred generally during colonialism is about crimes against humanity and genocide. Nobody wants to talk about that, except recently in the Herero example, I'm not sure you're aware, a year, a year ago, Namibia and Germany signed an agreement where Germany was gonna pay a billion dollars over the next 30 years to compensate the Herero, the Damara and the Nama for what happened to them between 1904 and 1908. So there is a gradual acceptance. There's a gradual growth of the phenomenon that something needs to be done. I'm not satisfied with the Namibian German agreement because it excluded the participation of the communities um, for them to participate in the agreement. Um, also, the, if you work it out, a billion dollars over 30 years is 30 million a year, which is less than the development aid that Germany actually pays. So we need to look at these issues in the context uh, and understand that reparations has been paid, but there's still many, many elephants in the room still. Thank you. I wonder whether you could follow up and address the, the point that Professor Black raised about whether there should be demands of the Africans who enslaved Africans in Africa. He raised that point. So I think equality would be that anybody who's poor, caused past harm should be responsible to some degree. However, how do you work that out? You know, I'm also not sure about how far back we should go. Are we talking about three or 400 years ago, or are we talking about the period from the 19th century? For me, one of the defining moments would be, for example, the Berlin Conference, which divided up Africa, 1884, 1885. And that brings me on to the point that international law really um, allows reparations. Most people say that international law doesn't, didn't see crimes happening at that time, that what was happening at those periods, the slave trade and issues relating to colonialism were perfectly permissible during 
uh, that particular era. And certainly that's not the case. So um, I wouldn't want to go back 2000 years or even 500 years. I think we want to go back to the colonial period, the last 200 years, even maybe less, and to do it in a more manageable way. To open it up to you know a long, a long uh, period ago would certainly cause more difficulties. Thank you very much. Yes, I think that's very interesting. And I, I think that's a very important observation because what we're talking about here and I'm I'm seeking what we ways to agree here. What we're talking about is looking at activities which we regard as open to redress, which when they occurred were against what would have been understood as international law. So if we go back to the Congress of Berlin, uh, by the time of the Congress of Berlin, um, the powers had got rid of slavery. Brazil was just about to do so, and the only imperial power that still had slavery, because it was expanding its power in the Horn of Africa, was Ethiopia, and it didn't get rid of its slavery till the early 20th century. Now, since then, since the 1880s, of course, alas, and it's appalling, slavery has occurred. It's occurred in a number of contexts. Um, and in some cases, as my colleague points out, there has been um, a measure of compensation. The most obvious one is that the German policy towards Jews involved not just extermination, but also the enslavement of people who worked in concentration camps. That was slavery. Um, and the, the difficulty we've got is that over the, you know, if you go back to the Congress of Berlin period till the present day, most slavery is not of the form of what we would call chattel slavery, you owe me, you own me, um, which is what most Americans think of when they think of slavery. Most of it is actually state slavery. You are imprisoned in a gulag for a political crime and you are worked to death. Um, and that goes on at the present day. And you might argue, for example, that the entire population of North Korea are state slaves. The chance of any compensation for that is virtually zero. Now, I'd be right. I'd be delighted to be proved wrong. I'd be absolutely delighted to be proven wrong. But if anybody can show me any jurisdiction that is going to make the Soviets pay compensation to those they enslaved in the gulags, or the Chinese pay compensation to those who are in work slaves as work camps in Xinjiang, or people pay compensation to the North Koreans. I'd be delighted to be proven wrong, but I just simply can't see it happening. Would you like to take this opportunity to prove uh, Pro Professor Black wrong? Well, let me say a couple of things. The mm. first is on the issue of international law. The slave trade was accepted as being illegal already in 1815 in the Vienna Declaration, signed by many of the major states in the world. We've seen international law uh, prosecute people. One of the first trials ever was in 1474. Somebody called Peter van Hagenbach was prosecuted before 28 countries for committing crimes against humanity. So the idea that international law was not available Certainly it was not available in treaty form, but certainly it was available in customary international law form. So certainly that's one particular distinction that is important to, to make. Certainly I agree that there are so many instances of human rights violations that don't uh, find accountability and don't find reparations. But we do find things being taken up today. So issues relating to what happened uh, in Ukraine 100 years ago, are now on the agenda. Issues of reparations between Italy and Germany for what happened in World War II are back on the agenda. The comfort woman uh, in Asia received compensation from Japan for the abuses they suffered, 200,000 of them, uh, by Japanese soldiers during World War II. So there's a growing phenomenon 
to provide reparations. What is true, and I agree very much, is the ability to go to court to find ways of getting reparations is almost non-existent because there's no court to go to. And that remains one of the biggest dilemmas. Most of these have to be solved politically. But there's a possibility that in the future, we find ways of finding that a court like the International Court of Justice will take it up. I've written that the International Court of Justice has been quite passive in dealing with issues. But certainly the League of Nations, the ICJ and other courts have not really been uh, well dispersed to taking up those particular matters. And hopefully over time, we find ways of dealing with those issues. Fundamentally, I, I, I believe this is an issue that's not going away. It's going to be, have to be solved. The Herero have said to me, they've waited 120 years. If they, want, if they have to wait another 100 years, they will wait. So this is an ongoing issue. And finding ways to remediate it has to become a critical issue for the future to find ways of actually addressing it. Thank you very much. Um, Professor Black, this issue is not going away, as Professor Sarkin has stated. I wonder whether you could um, talk about how this international debate involving reparations is evolving, what process or has been or has not been established by the international community to address the questions of reparations going forward. And I wonder whether you could uh, explain what issues you consider critical in any discussion about reparations. Uh, thank you. Um, I think in terms of process, I think my colleague is better placed than me. But in terms of um, the issues that I don't feel we've yet had an opportunity to mention, um, I think there are issues of equity. Um, for example, if you take a community or a state or a country, whatever you want to call it, um, let us say we're talking about the United States at the present moment, is somebody that came into America, as many people did from, say, India or Vietnam in the last 40 years, supposed to be eligible to, you know, be partly to blame for um, inequities visited on people 200 years ago, whether they were Native Americans or of, of black Americans or those people affected by American expansionism, say Mexicans, for example. So I think that there is this question of um, what is the nature within a community that you expect people to um, um, make reparations from, whatever it is, whatever form it takes, whether it's financial or apology or any other uh, form. That, I think, is an important one. Secondly, I think if we look at the present situation in the world, we can see if we're taking colonization, for example, or imperialism, we can see one of the problems is that the building blocks for international justice are states. And as my colleague correctly said, in some parts of the world, the state structure derives from post-imperial, in other words, imperial boundaries, and that those themselves create problems and issues. But in other cases, they don't. They, they arise from other boundaries. And I'm not sure that we would necessarily see a state as having any particular moral legitimacy. It may have a, um, an international credence in judicial bodies, but I'm not sure we would necessarily see governments, some of which, to be kind, are klepto, you know, kleptocracies or autocracies or military dictatorships, to see them asking, demanding, requesting, bullying, for whatever term you wish to use, um, against somebody else is sort of, you know, it's a bit makes one uncomfortable. And one can look at the constitutions of countries. One can look at the constitution of Syria, which dro dropped poison gas on its citizens uh, and has demanded compensation from France, incidentally, which was a mandate power. Um, but, and you know, its constitution, like the constitution of North Korea, is actually quite a benign constitution, but it doesn't describe the reality of its politics or policies. So I'm not sure I'm really happy or 
always with the players here in the in the uh, in this demand based situation. But again, you know, others will have different views. Would you like to respond to that? Absolutely. Richard? So, if we look at reparations only through the lens of climate justice, if we only look at the lens of understanding how global warming is affecting how the planet will survive, and we draw the connections to the countries and the societies that are least able to adapt, we see that those are the countries and the societies most affected by colonialism and the slave trade. They don't have the resources to address those issues. So in some ways, what we see is those societies are gonna be more affected than any other by issues such as climate justice ones. So for me, reparations as one example would be, let's find ways of redressing issues related to the sustainability of the planet so that indigenous people, colonized people, uh, particular minorities, et cetera, can cope with that particular issue. It's not really the global South that is responsible for global warming, but they benefited from underdevelopment and removing the resources from the global South. So one type of reparations would be to repair what societies are suffering from, from global warming to deal with those particular issues and to allow them to cope with global warming. As greater rainfall occurs in some places, as drought happens in certain places, as deforestation occurs, as desertification occurs, those are affecting some societies more than others. And reparations to deal with those issues where we find ways of mitigating climate change can be one way to help to repair the damages of the past. So for me, this is about ensuring innovation, creativity, finding ways to ensure that our planet is sustainable in the long term. So this just is one example of what reparations could look like. It is, you know, the, the, the feature that this is about providing individual reparations to individuals and how do you classify them and how do you see who would benefit where some people in a society are particularly well, wealthy. For me, that's really problematic and a problematic route to go down. It's about finding ways of benefiting societies as a whole, including to deal with real problems relating to environmental justice and climate justice. Let me say that I'm not saying that this is the solution. I think for me, this is one part of a jigsaw that can be built around which reparations can be uh, provided to societies that are going to have even greater difficulties in the future in dealing with global warming and issues relating to climate. Thank you very much. Would you like to respond before we move in our, uh, into our final round of flash? Questions. Yeah. I think I agree entirely that there should be enormous international assistance to the poorest over climate change. Yes, I think that I would agree with that entirely. And I'm, I'm not sure that I would see it as necessarily anything particularly to do with reparations. I think it's a matter of common justice of the wealthy towards the poor. Um, so I think that's important. Just one point that occurs to me, and I mean, you know, just we are all obviously affected by the news and the newspapers. So two items I've noticed in the last two days. One, there has been an enormous uh, reparations demand put in by Poland against Germany for its invasion in 1939 and its brutal, very brutal, subsequent murderous uh, rule of uh, Poland during the uh, World War II. So, uh, as my colleague says, I mean, it's very much a germane issue at the present day. Uh, I'm not sure quite how this is going to help Polish-German relations. That's another matter, but I, which is one that I do regard as consequential. But nevertheless, it is an important issue. But the second one, and, you know, it just indicates the difficulty of assessing issues such as you know, the, the activities of states, or if one wishes to use the term imperialism. If you look at conflicts or confrontations between, for example, 
Pakistan and India or Israel and its Arab neighbours, you will know that there are very different and very strongly held views there about what are perceived by, you know, as mistreatment, if you like, whatever terms you want to use. And I just can't quite see as somebody living in 2023, I can't quite see how any international body can reach an arbitrated agreement on whatever we mean by justice in these contexts, and then hope to implement it. And I, I am sort of, you know, it is in a way, rather, it doesn't mean you shouldn't do things. And I agree with my colleague, you know, I, I think what the Germans did with the Huraro is a good thing. I think, you know, that's good. But I do think we need to be aware that it is not necessarily going to work as a principle for governance in the world, and that there are many cases it won't do so. And I think I'll take that a stage further. We're a world population of about 8 billion. We've just cross that. COVID was a complete flop in terms of population control. Um, China and India between them are nearly 3 billion. And neither of those states are particularly interested in apologizing for anything. The BNP, which runs India, is very much a chauvinist Hindu movement. It has no interest in apologizing for anything. It instead builds up a sense of grievance against Muslims, the Brits as well, but the Muslims are the principal ones because they're the ones to kick around. And the Chinese have no intention of apologizing for anything. So what strikes me is that this is very much a, as it were, um, a group of the world, which is by no means necessarily the majority, talking to each other, not necessarily aware that there are many states where they're just not going to take part in this discussion in what we would regard as any meaningful sense. So for me, things change over time. So let me give you one example. Some years ago, um, the United Nations drafted a declaration on the rights of indigenous people. The major countries where indigenous people live is the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Those four countries refused to participate. But five or seven years after the uh, declaration uh, was, was agreed to, they all four joined. So it doesn't mean that things remain the same uh, over time and things can change. Broadly speaking, if we look at the way that the system works and we see how international law and international uh, processes have evolved, between 1945 and 1990, there were no international accountability mechanisms. It was only in 1993 with the genocide in um, the, Bal the Baltics and then with the Rwandan genocide, that institutions, criminal accountability institutions were created. So it took more than 50 years after Nuremberg to create accountability mechanisms. But we haven't moved to the stage of creating international mechanisms which are victim-centered, which provide reparations, which provide for truth. So my recent work is trying to provide a mechanism to deal with those people who have been arbitrarily detained and enforcedly disappeared in Syria, because there's no process internationally to deal with those particular issues. So broadly speaking, if we look at the claims for reparations, there's no international system to do so. International reparations is not a concept which is accepted by international law. They have to be done domestically. So we have to graduate our system to become more victim-centered, more victim-orientated. And until we do so, reparations will remain a political issue. So fundamentally, our system, and I agree with my colleague, it's a state-centered system. And states are protected by that because they are not accountable for issues such as their past violations. We can see, for example, what's happening between Russia and Ukraine. There's no mechanism to hold countries responsible for the crime of aggression. The International Criminal Court, is, there's a debate, can they hold uh, President Putin uh, accountable? 
Yes, they've issued an arrest warrant, but many people are against the International Criminal Court and what it does. So we have many gaps in our international legal system and reparations remains the biggest one. As I've said, reparations still remains an intrastate issue. It, um, uh, reparations between states has not really become a major issue unless we talk about the specific examples. But again, time will evolve those issues. We do have our examples, but I think the clamor for reparations between states will grow over time. Thank you very much. This brings us to our final series of questions and, and a lightning round of questions. And I wonder, I want, want to start with you, Professor Jeremy Sarkin. How will society know whether reparations work? Well, the question is really, what do you mean by work? Mm -hmm. Because we can get symbolic reparations such as apologies. We can get renaming of streets. We can get educational um, disbursements. There are many things that can be done to change the legacy of the past. Many things can be done to develop a society through developmental projects. We can talk about individual reparations or collective reparations. So for example, the African court recently has awarded reparations for a tribe uh, against Kenya. We've seen that in many cases, particularly the, the um, Inter-American Court on Human Rights has been very good at awarding reparations against states um, in Guatemala, Honduras, uh, Chile, Argentina. So we've seen in particular parts of the world, there's an ability to award reparations. We can also see reparations as being divided into a whole range of issues. And one of the ones that I think are most important is what we call guarantees of non-repetition. How do we ensure that states don't repeat the same cycle again? What mechanisms do we put in place to make sure that there's security, form, uh, security sector reform, that we have checks and balances on um, the way that the state is run? What we see is happening in Israel about the judiciary is largely about what the society believes will be the result if those checks and balances by the courts are removed. So we need to see reparations as multifaceted. And how we determine those things can make great differences. If we simply look at reparations through the lens of cash, it's a very limited way to understand what can be done. So we've had, for example, um, Nelson Mandela wearing a rugby jersey was a major form of reparations and apology. Um, President Ramos Horta from, I um, uh, can't remember the name of the country, but East Timor, going to church in 1995 with the president of Indonesia as a form of um, reconciling. Chancellor Willy Brandt falling to his knees. We've seen how important small steps can be, but we also need to see the big steps and we need to find ways of dealing with those things. So my plea is not to see reparations as simply about handouts. There are many types of reparations which need to be given. Thank you very much. Professor Black, is there any part of this argument or this discussion what is in your view, is it possible in your view, are there any people any persons who are really who might be entitled to reparations? Oh, yes. I mean, I think that, as it were, during people's life, that's part of what I would regard as the process of redress of crime. And, you know, I don't see any reason why crime should not be considered in a international context as well as a domestic context. I mean, I agree on that. I mean, my difficulty is the notion about responsibility for uh, matters far back in time. And I think this has been a fruitful conversation because I think what we've 
seen is that um, there are uh, ways in which one can look at how best to debate those. I mean, clearly, there has to be some sort of limit. I mean, when I go to Italy, I don't imagine that an Italian should apologise to me because, you know, the Romans invaded England 2,000 years ago. You know, I would regard that as ridiculous. Um, and I think part of the question is how best one thinks about our relationship with the past if one can see aspects of the past which clearly can be shown to have a consequence in the present day, then it seems reasonable to consider how one addresses them. And I agree with Professor Sarkin there. I hope I have got that right, you know, totally. But what I'm not sure is that the whole burden of the past can be even profitably debated today, because simply we would just be swallowed up by it. It's so complex going back over such a large period. And I actually felt that Professor Sarkin's discussion about focusing on the period uh, from the division of Africa during the Berlin process in the 1880s was a very helpful one in trying to delimit a part of the war of the past that was, as it were, graspable from a part of the past which, you know, we can debate, we can discuss, but where it's harder to really think through some of these issues without, in a sense, a danger of anachronism. So certainly for me, it's not only about the issues in people's lifetime. For me, it's also about what I call intergenerational justice. That what happened to our grandparents and our great grandparents and our, even our great great grandparents can deeply affect societies today in many ways. And that's about the levels of income, it's about levels of wealth, it's about levels of education, it's about levels of health, it's about levels of disparity. Those are continuing cycles which get handed down from generation to generation. So I wouldn't think to say we should only go back so many years. We should go back into what is measurable and what impact it's having today. So I would say if we're going to go through a reparations process, we need to be scientific about it. We need to understand what happened. What are the consequences? What are the legacies today? How do we redress those particular legacies? For me, it's not about handing out money, but it might be to provide developmental projects in particular areas, provide education in particular areas. So for example, between Namibia and uh, Germany, I would think that people from Namibia should be given educational scholarships to uplift themselves. Namibia, I believe, should be, have some land reform project which finds ways of removing the 3,500 German farmers who own 70% of the land and go through a rest, restoration pr process. We don't want what happened in Zimbabwe where the land simply gets removed. And that is the potential for the future in particular places. So we need orderly processes, processes which are done fairly which are done equitably to find best ways going forward. So um, the danger always, if we don't do those particular issues, eventually there'll be violence and there'll be greater conflict. So how do we do it in a way that everybody can benefit? So sharing becomes an important point. Professor Black said, those who are wealthy have responsibilities to those who are poor. I agree with that, particularly if those who are wealthy became wealthy because they benefited from the wealth that the poor had in particular places. And we need to do more to correct that imbalance. We also need to remember what was the end of colonialism was the removing of all the infrastructure in colonial societies and taking it to the developed world. All the natural resources that were removed. There has to be some form of providing what in law we call unjust enrichment, that those societies that benefited from 
the global south have to provide ways of capacitating the global south to resurrect their sectors that really um, were undermined as a result of uh, colonialism. So for me, there are many issues and many challenges, and I believe it can be done. The danger is if we don't do it, then people in societies will take it in their own hands to do so. Um, and uh, therefore, my plea is to do what is necessary in the shorter term rather than the longer term. Thank you very much. I, um, so this brings us, I think we have eight minutes left, maybe. Is that right? Seven minutes. I want each of you to take two minutes to sum up your arguments, make your final case for um, answering this question, whether reparations are a fair way of addressing past injustices and harms caused by colonizers. Just two minutes um, and a speed round speaking to the audience who will vote in a minute. We'll start with Professor Black. I think what we've had in a discussion is the useful expression of a range of views on this complex matter. For me, the focus should be on the iniquities and sufferings in the world today. I'm cherry about a devoting too much attention, particularly to the distant past. The more recent past within our living experience, I, I have a different viewpoint for, but I don't think that's, as it were, part of reparations. I think that's part of common justice. Um, but I find I'm uneasy when I look around the world and see so much suffering and so much cruelty to think of people beating up on what happened in the 16th or 17th or 18th centuries. So I would rather focus on addressing the issues of that they're almost certainly slaves, people who are here against their will, um, maybe sex slaves within five miles of here, maybe even within two miles of here. And in a way, there is something slightly odd about us discussing the past when one looks at the world of the present. Awesome. Professor Sarkin. So thank you very much. Um, for me, it's about not separating what is happening in the present and the past. So I would agree with Professor Black. We need to do a lot more about what's happening today. There are many places around the world where there are massive human rights violations, whether it's China, North Korea, Syria, Yemen. Um, I can go on. The list is endless. In fact, the levels of human rights violations are going up around the world. So certainly, I think we need to find ways of dealing with those particular issues. But that does not discount the need to deal with the past as well. Certainly, we can find ways of limiting how far back we need to go. But the issue of massive crimes, massive human rights violations, issues which undermine societies, issues about underdevelopment, Issues about the slave trade have deep effects. And once again, to mention this notion of intergenerational trauma that have caused a legacy of huge divides between people across the world. So certainly understanding the past and coming to terms with the past is particularly important. We can see, as I said uh, earlier, the movement for reparations is growing dramatically and there's a greater willingness the UN has taken this up, uh, even though there have been sporadic conversations and various resolutions adopted. And in fact, the first resolution was in 1960, where the resolution was taken that colonialism is a, was a form of crimes against humanity. So this is not a new issue in any particular way. But it's a question about now being able to do something about it, to find ways of addressing those particular matters. As I said, this debate often gets couched in a financial sense. And for me, we need to look at reparations in a much wider sense about what is possible. Certainly, part of the problem is the way that the international system is built. The UN often is not able to come up with particular processes to actually deal with those um, particular problems of the past. So, for example, there have been an inability to create a mechanism to prosecute people from Syria 
as a result of the massive crimes that have happened there over the last 12 or 13 years. That's true. For example, there was a report out this week about the massive numbers of crimes that are being committed in North Korea, where there are half a million people in arbitrary detention, uh, hundreds of thousands of people who have faced enforced disappearances. I can name many countries where that particular situation is true. We need to do better at dealing with those particular circumstances. And for me, the present is as important to deal with as is the case with the past. The two are deeply connected. And unless we deal with the past and coming, find ways of dealing with them, we're going to have future violations. So finding ways to address them now will give pause to people in the future who are likely to commit violations again. States will invade other states if there's no possibility to hold them accountable. So dealing with a crime of aggression is important to stop other crimes and to stop other states committing them. In the same way, if we don't have processes to ensure that reparations are paid, then other states will find the ability to actually do a lot more violations against their own citizens even, never mind others, if we don't have forms of ensuring that states are held accountable. So just to use the Ukraine example, holding Russia accountable for the war crimes, the, and I, the lots of war crimes I could talk about. For me, one of the issues I think that doesn't get enough attention is the attacks on infrastructure, on um energy and water. Those are war crimes. Somebody has to pay to redevelop them in the future. And for me, that has to be the country that caused them. If we develop the system that countries are held accountable for what they did, it's likely that states will be careful and not commit those particular violations in the future. So reparations can be a form of justice as well. And we need to see that as being an important part of this debate. Thank you very much. Um, so reparations can be a form of justice. This has been a great conversation. I wanna turn it over to the audience. I hope that you've learned a lot from these great professors, colleagues here uh, discussing reparations. Um, now it's time for you guys to vote again um, to see whether you've, maybe you've changed your mind. Uh, so we'll take some time for you to vote online. QR, QR code. Online, there's a link in the chat to vote. Well, thank you very much for coming out. It's been great having you. Great to see people in the audience. Thank you for coming such a long way to share your knowledge and wisdom, Professor Black and Professor Sarkin. I've learned a lot. I hope the students and the audience have learned a lot of, about this really critical issue of reparations. And it's been great to be here. I'll turn it over to the facilitator. Thank you again. A round of applause, a round of applause. I'm going to buy us some time while we wait for the results to come in, but I'm going to buy us some time with information. Um, so first of all, this, I think, was a deeply rich and layered discussion. You were lucky to be in the audience because now you see that it isn't easy. And we are trying to choose topics that we think are relevant, um, that an academic and other community will care about, and um, in response to which there actually are policy solutions, depending upon where you fall in terms of the actual question. Um, so I appreciate, again, the civility of this discourse, the facts that were used in this discourse. Um, I would say even the kindness and consideration that we saw here today, and that part of this series is meant to model a way of interacting with people and a way of interacting with ideas. And it also kind of required you to do something that is rare these days. So we asked you that you'd be on your phone only for the vote. 
And though our programs are typically governed by questions and answers, it actually asks you to sit on your questions, to sit with your questions, to wait, and to actually see what they had to say and if that shaped your opinion in any way. Because obviously, during uh, the reception, you'll you'll be able to besiege them and ask um, anything that that you'd like as a follow up. So that this is a slightly different format than we use for for most of our most of our convenings. So I want to again give another round of applause to our distinguished panel. And while we wait for um, results to come in, which will take me just one minute, assuming that I don't erase them by accident. I wanted to also let you know about a couple of uh, things that are happening at Perry World House as the semester winds down. So first of all, on April the 11th, we will be um, having a public program with Kenneth Roth, who is the former executive director of Human Rights Watch on China and its human rights record. So we hope that we will find you here and you will find this online by the end of the week. On April 17th, we're having an extraordinary program um, put forward by one of our wonderful postdocs on really exposing war crimes and human rights abuses and the role of photography in doing that. And we're gonna have a super robust um, discussion and that's on the 17th of April. On the 18th of April, we're gonna have a program on stopping the next pandemic because yes, there will be one managing the threat of animal disease. And uh, on April 24th, you're gonna have a very rich conversation on the digital democracy experiment in Estonia that will feature Estonia's ambassador to the US. This is a program that is co-sponsored by the Andrea Mitchell Center for the Study of Democracy. And it's a part of the digital democracy series and the last, in fact, of a year long program. Um, before I announce the kind of results, I wanted to let you also know that you can find this program on YouTube in a couple of days, um, and that you can always follow us on our mailing list and our website and on social media. And with that, I'm gonna tell you the results of our time here. So at the start of the program, there were 51% 51 per, 51 of the respondents answered the question, can reparations redress the harms of colonization and slavery? 51% said yes and 49% said no. At the end of this discussion, 71% um, said yes, and 29% said no. So there has been some changing of opinion, and that is one of the many purposes of today's uh, conversation. So we thank you, our audience, we thank you, our guests, and we invite you all to a reception in our student lounge. Thank you very much. <laughs>